Uh, yeah, so maybe uh, you can tell from the fact that I'm going to give a talk on the blackboard that um, I'm a mathematician. Uh, I'll admit ahead of the time that I, I don't know very much physics. Uh, this is going to be more on the, the, the mathematics side, but I hope that physicists will ask lots of questions, and I really, really hope that the people who know both mathematics and physics will help me answer those questions. Uh, there's not going to be topological matter in this talk per se. I'm going to be talking about some of the mathematical abstractions, which help explain some of the simplest versions of that. So in particular, I'm going to be talking about fusion categories. Uh, to tell the story I want to tell, uh, I'm going to need to also talk about uh, uh, modular tensor categories and subfactors. And I hope that uh, everyone will be somewhat interested in this story because I'm actually going to be talking about concrete examples and showing interesting, or potentially interesting concrete examples of, uh, of all of these things. So uh, my, my plan for the talk is to start off by making some provocative statements about what fusion categories look like, uh, and then to spend the rest of the sort of introductory section of the talk just giving you definitions of all of these things. Uh, that might take a, a long time, I'm not sure, but I will get to the end of the introductory section and break, uh, and then I'll tell you uh, about our efforts to classify small instances of the all these sorts of objects afterwards. Okay, so the first provocative statement that I want to make is to um, contradict something that Zheng Hong Wong said yesterday, which was that um, he, at some point early in his talk, was talking about modular tensor categories, and I guess he mentioned fusion categories as well. And he said that we have a, a well-developed mathematical theory of these things, um, which is true in some sense. I mean, the abstract machinery has been there for a while, and we know lots of things to do with it. But in terms of examples of what actual instances of these things look like, we still know essentially almost nothing. Uh, we have no good tools for taking a, a fusion category or a modular tensor category and decomposing it into smaller pieces. Uh, and we have very little sense of, of what should be true about a, a general instance of one of these things. So those are the sort of questions that I'm going to try and, and get at. Uh, sorry. The, uh, so we know very little. About examples. And the sort of question that we, we don't really well, that we can start trying to think about is sort of, do they fall into families? Or is it just a mess? <coughs> and uh, we haven't really got very far yet, so I think that it's not possible to give good answers. But let me make the, uh, the a claim well, it's not, a, it's not a theorem, but uh, here we go. The one reason it's not a theorem is that uh, this is just a statement about the fusion categories that we happen to know of at this point, or maybe the ones that I happen to know of at this point, uh, and surely there are going to be lots and plenty more discovered, and there's no reason to expect that, that uh, they will actually satisfy what we've got so far. Uh, and I think, in fact, Victor told me something over breakfast which might contradict what I'm about to say. Um, but what I want to say is that every known fusion category so far is related. And maybe in a second I'll come over here and tell you what I mean by related uh, to one of the following. So the first case here is uh, Rep G, the representation theory of some finite group. That's suddenly some tensor category. And when I come back and say exactly what a fusion category is, you'll see that really is a fusion category. Uh, it's a GF finite group. And to make, try and make this a little bit more precise, let me say uh, a few more things here. Alternatively, maybe you might think about uh, vec G, that is G graded vector spaces, vector spaces graded by some finite group. And to make to account for a few more things, let me say vec omega g. So maybe there's some there's some three co-cycle on the group that you can use to modify the associativity in the uh, in the category of g graded vector spaces. 
So those things are all examples of, of fusion categories. Okay, then the next main source of fusion categories is ref UQG. So here G is some, um, some complex semi-simple Lie algebra. UQG is the, is the quantum group. And then we can look at its representation theory. Well, but what I really mean here is at Q a root of unity. And you have to, uh, well, there are some technical details you have to take this category of children modules and semi-simplify it and whatever. But uh, these, are, um, these are examples that I think lots of people know about. Um, people, um, you can also get these same categories um, from affine Lie algebra, for example. Okay, so there's all these things coming from quantum groups. And then there's, I'm gonna list two more things here. So uh, one is gonna be something called <coughs> a quadratic category. So uh, at least some of these have been mentioned so far already in the conference. I forget uh, in which talk it was, but someone mentioned Tambara Yamagami categories, and they were the first instances of these that people thought about. So here, uh, there's a uh, there's a group in this category, uh, a group of invertible objects. So that just means objects in the category with this dimension one, essentially. A group of invertible objects. <coughs> and just one other orbit. So once you've got this group of invertible objects, you can sort of act on all the objects by tensoring with these invertible objects, and we're just saying that all the other objects form a single orbit when you tensor with, the, with this group of invertible objects. And so by now we have lots of examples of these. Um, we've got a, a pretty good theory of, of how they work. If you tell me a group and what the other orbit looks like, you can sort of give a classification of the possible categories given that data. But the, a, a really interesting thing is that these guys turn out to explain a bunch of known examples that had previously looked really strange, but now kind of start to fall into, into families. Um. Oh, um, yeah, so quadratic is meant to be slightly more general than near group. Um. Really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So here, I want to allow examples like the. We'll come to this in a second, but like the, the category that's the even part of Hagerup, is a is a quadratic category. These guy, there's a group of invertible objects out here, as Edmond three, and there's one other orbit of objects, whereas the yeah the, the Tambara Yamagamis would just have a single guy, which is an invertible. Oh, I mean the. Um, the dimensions of the objects are, are in a quadratic extension, I think is, is one way to think. Um, yes, according to this definition, but I forget the details, maybe Dave remembers or Noah. Sometimes you can just prove very quickly that it's abelian, uh, but I forget exactly what Azumi's theorem in that direction is. All of the known examples are certainly abelian. And maybe I should, maybe when I said that uh, you can sort of classify them. Maybe that also only works if you if you put them in the Abelian group of fields. Okay, and then number four, uh, the extended Hagerup subfamily, which I'll come to right near the end of the talk. But uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, what we know at the moment here really doesn't let us answer this sort of question. Lots of things fall into nice families here but it's also a mess. There are just some weird examples that apparently have nothing to do with the rest of mathematics that uh, come along at the bottom. Okay, um, if people know how to, how to oh, maybe, okay, let, let me say what related here is. Yeah, yeah. So what are these uh, three other four has uh, shown to be fusion ones? They are not, <coughs> they are not realizable by the mind. Um, let me, postpone that question till near the end. Uh, I think I, I, I plan to come back to that. I, I mean, I can, I can tell you why this one is, does, is, not, is not in one or two. There's a good answer for, for why number four is not in one or two. Yeah, also, a really good question. What are the adjunctive sample which we have? In that one. Wait, the adjunctive sample is three and not four, which we have. Oh. Produced by adjunctive sample one. Yeah, we'll, 
maybe we'll come to that at the end. Uh, there's not much evidence either way. So, yeah. Okay. How do? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh well. So let's see. Um, so there are some fusion categories here, and we, as of last month, know the modular data for the center of these guys here. And I think we know all of the fusion categories and router equivalents of these guys. And but I guess none of those things actually answer the question. Um, what? No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, I think that we know, um, and the, the there are three fusion categories that you get out of this fourth thing here that are Merida equivalent to each other, but not to anything else. Uh, well, no, they're Merida equivalent to some other things, and in fact, some other things that previously would have been other entries on this list are sort of now explained via Merida equivalence with these guys, but I don't think we've seen, well, some of the really small examples there are intersections between all of these three things, but I think we have things in here that uh, it feels unlikely to me that we're either equivalent to it. So yeah. 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 Uh, Twenty-two. Okay, so related here. Uh, yeah, 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 great. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I mean, my take on that is that that's sort of a purely formal statement that doesn't help very much. <laughs> I, I mean, the, um, the, the, I forget, you've got to put quasi in there a few times, don't you, to, to make it true even, but I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, that, that just isn't, isn't a helpful thing to, to say, to, to talk about, ac to talk about in instances of fusion categories or whatever. Yeah, I, yes, I'll get that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so I just wanted to write down sort of a list of some of the recipes uh, that we're allowed to use when I say related here. Um, so, uh, so we can take subcategories, we can take tensor products of other categories, we can take G graded extensions, as was talked about yesterday in the in the modular tensor category case, but we can also do in the fusion case. Um, let me finish writing the list and then I'll uh, answer that question. Yeah. Uh, equivariantizations and de-equivariantizations uh, and Marita equivalences. And maybe someone can suggest things I should add to that list if they want to. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, I mean, I don't know how to get fusion categories out of, out of anything else, I guess. Uh, if you do, tell me about it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the plan for the rest of the introductory section is to remind you the definition of fusion categories, modular tensor categories, and subfactors, and to say what Maruda equivalence is. Uh, can the people sitting over here See this board? Okay. Okay, so let's start with a relatively easy one. A fusion category. Uh, is a semi-simple tensor category. Uh, with finitely many simple objects. Now, something to insist on is that it's not necessarily symmetric. It's not necessarily even graded, even though uh, the first couple of examples are. I mean, rep G is a symmetric tensor category. These rep QGs are all, all graded tensor categories. But we very quickly run into things that are neither symmetric nor, nor graded. In fact, uh, I mean, vec G, as soon as G is non-abelian, is, is not, not symmetric or graded. 
Um, yeah, so when I write this definition so briefly, I'm going to uh, make Tensor do a lot of work here. Um, so here, uh, I'm going to have this say that, first of all, so it's in the noidal category. It's um, the uh, linear, and maybe for the sake of making life easy, it's the linear over C. Uh, and rigid, uh, which means sort of, I'm not going to say exactly, but it just means well-behaved duals. So every object has a dual. There are duals of morphisms, and they all play together pretty much the same way that duals work in vector spaces. Um, that said, the definition doesn't require pivotal, which is even better behaved duals, but it's a very good conjecture that every fusion category is actually pivotal. And yeah, let's make, uh, let's make the tensor identity uh, simple. Ah, so, okay, so, um, <coughs> the, okay, so, so a category is symmetric if every time you've got objects V and W in the category, you've got a map from V tensor W to W tensor V uh, that's natural in V and W, and also that sort of these maps here behave just the way that the, the sort of generators of the symmetric group behave. That is, if you cross things that way, it's the same as crossing things that way, and so on, okay? So that's a symmetric category. You've got these maps that behave like the symmetric group, and then a braided tensor category is just one where you've got these maps, but they don't behave like the symmetric group, they behave like the generators in the braided group. Yeah, I mean, so a symmetry is a braiding which squares to the identity, is another way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so let me give you um, a, I'll try and aim for a useful answer rather than a every, every detail correct answer. So what we want from simple objects is just that the only maps from, an, from X to X uh, are, the, are multiples of the identity, okay? There are no endomorphisms except the, the boring ones. Uh, so what we want there to be is a, we want there to be a collection of objects in this category, which are all simple in that sense, and moreover, have no maps between them. So if you've got two distinct simple objects, X and Y, we want no homs between them. And then we want every object in the category to decompose as a direct sum of uh, of that collection of simple objects, and that's one way of saying that that semi-simple is not homogeneous. Okay. Um, okay. So that's a that's a fusion category. Um, uh, a modular tensor category. I won't actually have a lot of modular tensor categories in this talk, but. Given the audience, it seems worth mentioning them when they come up. So there's a fusion category with a little bit of extra, well, I mean, this is a stupid definition, saying that it's a fusion category with a little bit of extra stuff, but I'll fix it. Uh, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> this is great, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm not quite sure. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, does someone want to help me out here? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I think maybe you're talking about like an automorphism of the category rather than morphisms inside the category. So like there are no, yeah, there are, there are no ways to, there's no way to turn one of those anyons into another one, but there might be some external symmetry that lets you change the identities if they're, if they're yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, automorphisms of the categories are, uh, inter are interesting things that will matter in other places, but yeah, they're not, we're just talking, the objects are the, uh, are the types of anyons and the morphisms are the, are the whatever word physicists use for things that can happen to anyons that turn into other ones. Um, okay, so a modular tensor category is a fusion category, um, which is braided, 
in the sense we just talked about a moment ago, uh, spherical, which I'm just going to pass over without saying anything about, and uh, whose S matrix. So S is this matrix indexed by objects I and J, the simple objects in the category. And as we said yesterday, I think um, the entries of the S matrix are just the values of the hop length labeled by those two simple objects. Uh, and this matrix has to be in vertical. Okay. So the thing to say is that uh, typically, well, or maybe very often, uh, rep U to G is modular, or if it's not modular, it's not very far from being modular. Sometimes there are a few objects that get in the way, a few transparent objects that get in the way. So I'm going to say often rep U to G is modular, but just so people have examples to keep in mind, uh, rep G or never is, because as we talked about, well, maybe G is trivial or something, um, because as we said, rep G is actually symmetric. As soon as you're symmetric, uh, the hops length, you can just untie it, just becomes uh, two unlinked circles, and that just gives us the dimension of the object I times the dimension of the object J. So you can see the S matrix is just rank one, okay? So once you're symmetric, you're very far from being modular. Okay. Now, this definition makes it look like a modular tensor category is a special type of choosing category. But I think that's a bad way to think about what modular tensor categories are. Um, so really, uh, modular tensor categories live at a different level. And I think this is sort of, well, Here, what I want to say is that fusion categories are sort of very special types of two categories, and modular tensor categories are really special types of three categories. Um, if you haven't heard people say tensor categories are two categories with a single object, and braided tensor categories are three categories with a single object and a single one morphism, then I'm not going to explain it further, but you should go away and think about it someday or ask someone to explain it to you. Um, but really, they're kind of meant to live at different levels. And I think that's reflected in the, in the way they're used in, in physics as well. Uh, they're about two and three dimensional. Yeah, so, well, few, so tensor categories, uh, so two categories usually have three levels, but tensor categories are boring at the bottom level. Three categories usually have four levels, but braided tensor categories are boring at the bottom two levels. Fusion and, modu and modular both add extra conditions beyond that, but that's an aside. Okay. So the reason I think that's important is because we're on this topic. Yeah. So uh, if you were to look at morphisms of positive objects and negative objects, and you had to guess what the definition of the uh, appropriate one is. Crochet. Yeah, there you go. That's the physics way. Yeah, so I mean, very typical things that you, like, you might start with two copies of some object X, and if the object is self-dual in the category, that means you've got some, some process which starts with X tensor X and spits out the tensor identity, and that's a sort of a, a, a particle which is its own antiparticle and okay, that, that sort of thing, which is typically more. And I mean, that's basically given by sort of thinking about morphisms from the tensor identity to something else, uh, of sort of states of that, of that state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it fair to say that there is no sort of one final definition of what is modular? So modular tensor categories are what we have to apply our thinking to, and we have to apply the same thinking to them as we would to any other category? No. So, I mean, this is the all this business about, uh, I mean. You typically see in random multiplication that basically you get a bunch of balls in the air. So there, there is no sort of. Yeah, I mean, I mean this business with levels uh, is, is thoroughly confusing because modular tensor categories are really, really special three categories and so give you invariance of things one dimension lower than you might typically expect for three categories. Uh, so yeah, 
Mm. Maybe I shouldn't have said that because it just makes life worse. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, so I mean, um, I mean, off the top of my head, I can't, I, I won't get one right, but uh, very often, so I mean, what do the objects look like in, in ref u q g? Uh, if you're not at a root of unity, they're just given by these uh, sort of integer points in the, uh, in the positive Weyl chamber of the corresponding Lie algebra. And then when you look at a root of unity, you cut it off at some, at some wall. And uh, very often, well, at, at particular levels, you'll see some guys out here which are, you know, you can see are sort of symmetric with the, the, the trivial guy. And often these guys are transparent. That is, they, they braid trivially with everything else. And that makes the, the S matrix non-invertible. And so you have just have to kind of avoid those levels or uh, you can always modularize the category by killing those guys and getting some quotient that's modular again, but this happens quite often. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I, I'm, uh, I mean, if I only get through the introductory part of my talk, and then it's fine. Um, um, okay. So what can I speed up? Um, that's the question. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press on. Um, there's this construction, the, the center construction. You feed it in a fusion category, and you get out a modular tensor category. Uh, and th this is a, an important gadget. Uh, I'm almost up to subfactors, uh, but I need to say one more thing. Ah, uh, OK, yeah, I, that's right. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's put spherical there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what do I need to say? So we, I promised I'd explain Maruta equivalence, and that's the last thing I need to say before I get to what a subfactor is. So fusion category uh, C and D are Maruta equivalent. Uh, if there's a bimodule category, so what does a bimodule category mean? Uh, so, so this is a, a C, D bimodule category. So this means that we can take an object in C and fuse it with an object in with M, tensor it with an object in M and get another object in M. Or we can take an object in M and tensor it with an object in D and get an object in M. So it doesn't have a tensor product itself, but you can tensor on the left with C and tensor on the right with D. And similarly for morphisms as well. Okay. Uh, such that, well, I can take M and I can tensor it with sort of its, its opposite category. There's an easy thing to do that sort of that turns it over and makes a DC bimodule category. And then there's this notion of tensor product over a category. I'm not going to define it, but it's sort of a categorical version of tensoring modules over a ring. And this guy, which is itself now a CC bimodule category, should just be C itself. And you can do it the other way around. You can tensor M dual over C with M, and that should be D. Okay? So this is, once you know what all the definitions of these symbols mean at the categorical level, this is just like the definition of Maruta equivalence for rings, but it's one level higher. Okay. And in fact, um, C and D are Maruta equivalent uh, if and only if. Their centers, I guess I didn't write this, this, uh, this symbol, I'm going to use Z for the center, if and only if their centers are isomorphic. Uh, So often we have, we have uh, yeah, just I mean saying that we often have many categories that are Maruta equivalent to each other with a single center. And the, um, the, 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 the fusion categories.
categories give us Tsurai of Euro theories, the modular tensor categories give us Lecher Fukin Tsurai of theories, and Maruja equivalent Fukin categories, at least at the top levels, are going to give us isomorphic uh, invariants of, of two and three manifolds. Yep. Uh, yep. Sometimes, and, uh, okay. and, and uh, yeah, if the plan for my talk would have mentioned an example of this, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay, so finally, uh, a finite depth oops, uh, subfactor uh, is, except uh, Vaughan and, and uh, Vaughan Jones and Sue and Topper are both in the audience. So I can't actually say is here without giving someone a heart attack. Um, <laughs> uh, so let me say a little bit more. Uh, uh, of the hyperfinite 2, 1, everyone can ignore that, uh, 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 has a complete invariant, which everyone else in the audience can read as is. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I mean, the, okay. A little bit more context there. Um, this complete invariant um, comes in many different forms. Um, originally, uh, due to um, Thun Popper as a, as a lambda lattice and then reformulated in many ways as power groups and planar algebras and so on. Um, it's only a complete invariant in these, all these, in the case of all of these uh, parenthetical uh, adjectives I've added on. Um, it's nevertheless an, an interesting, uh, a very interesting invariant. Um, but when you drop those extra conditions, there's a lot, lot more to the story. Okay, uh, has a complete invariant, which is what? Um, it's an algebra object, A, in some fusion category C. So what's an algebra object? Well, in vector spaces, an algebra object is just some vector space A along with an associative map that takes you from A tensor A back to A again. Okay, you can just say those same words in an arbitrary fusion category, okay? Uh, there are some extra things I should say about the algebra object which I just won't say. Um, the, but we can extract the, this pair of objects from a, from a subfactor. And I just want to show you a little bit of what we get from that. Uh, we find <coughs> the AA bimodule objects, so that is the objects in C which we can equip with a map that tells you how to multiply by A on either side, the AA bimodule objects themselves form another fusion category. Which I'll call D. <coughs> and the one A bimodule objects, so that's just the sort of right module objects in C, give another category M, which is a Marita equivalence. Uh, between C and D. Okay, so this setup, uh, we have a pair of fusion categories and a Marita equivalence between them. And this finally is sort of the justification for bringing subfactors into a, into a, into a talk entitled exotic fusion categories. Subfactors in this particular sense, are about studying Maruta equivalences between fusion categories. And we've, we've in practice found that it's, uh, we've made a lot of progress classifying these objects and learnt then things about, about fusion categories that we were originally after. <laughs> I, I told you to read that as is, and then there's, here's the definition. Um, I mean, it's a, uh, a factor is a von Neumann algebra with trivial center, and a subfactor is a pair of these one sitting inside the other. Um, the um, it's a long story to see how you extract these guys from the original sort of analytic origins of the paper. Yeah, I know that you want to say that, but I'm interested to discuss the multiple basis for the unit theory. Yeah, I always get this wrong. Um, what exactly do we need to say? Um, Yeah, so yeah, so okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, 
<laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, there's, there's the end of the introductory part of my talk. Um, I think we've had enough questions. <laughs> I might just keep going <laughs> and pretend that, uh, okay, we paused for questions just there. Okay. Okay, so I've said all, I've given a whole lot of definitions so far, but not said anything at all that justifies that claim I made at the beginning about uh, what examples actually look like. So, people have been trying in quite a few different directions to understand what small fusion categories might look like. And let me just briefly say some of the directions in which people have gone to try and study small ones. So one is studying small rank fusion categories, that is fusion categories with only a few isomorphism classes of simple objects. And there we know the answer up to the spectacularly high number of rank three. Uh, rank four is getting close to done. There's been pretty good progress, but it's not quite done now. If you add more adjectives like modular or all the dimensions of integers or square roots of integers, you can get a bunch further due to a bunch of people in the room. Um, so small rank is one possible way, a uh, few simple objects. Another thing that you can do is look at small morphism spaces. So for example, you could look at, um, you could look at categories with some object, some favorite object X in the category, and you could, look, you could ask for this, the, these home spaces to map from the trivial into some tensor power of your favorite object uh, being small. And so for example, uh, If that sequence of num oh sorry, I meant to write dimension in front of there, the dimension of these home spaces. So if you have some bounds on the, the sizes of these home spaces, it turns out you can prove classification theorems. And there's a whole lot of theorems of this form. Um, Greg Kuperberg, Vaughan Jones, Kuber and Wenzel, uh, and Emily Stork tomorrow will be about, I guess, this particular sequence and some stories that get told there. It's a function of k, yeah. So here's k equals zero. <laughs> There's k equals <laughs> one. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry? <laughs> that's the punch line. Don't worry. We're getting there. <laughs> um, so that's one possibility. Small rank. There's this guy. Uh, there's the global dimension of C, which is the sum of, of, of the squares of dimensions of irreducibles. We could bound this, and we have embarrassingly little to say about that story. Uh, I wish there was more to say. Um, and then finally, uh, well, there's small index subfactors, which, although it's not obvious from what I've said so far, this is pretty much the same as uh, having an object X with small dimension. Okay, and um, I mean, there's a little bit to the story there, but, but these are very close to asking the same question. And this is what's going to be the remainder of the talk, talking about this particular case, so where I'm going to tell you what we can and un what we know, really I'm going to tell you what we know about small index subfactors, but you're meant to be thinking that it's answering the question, what do we know about fusion categories having an object with a very small quantum dimension, where very small is going to mean barely bigger than two, so it's just like two plus epsilon. Okay. Um, the, I mean, the connection here is that uh, the, um, uh, the dimension of this algebra object is, the, uh, is what's called the index of the subfactor. So uh, the index is related to the quantum dimension of that algebra object we were talking about here. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the global dimension of the category. And this is the irreducible object. Here. A, oh, so A over here was the algebra object in the fusion category, and the dimension is just the, the trace of the identity on that object. Of the simple object sitting inside it, yeah. 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 Uh, M is the Morita equivalence between C and D. So M is the bimodule category that C and D act on from, from both sides. So it gives the Morita equivalence between the two, between the two. Okay. What time I, I meant to stop at half an hour. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Okay. No, no, the algebra object actually has the dimension of the, the, the yeah, has, has the, the dimension of the, Okay.
So how do we start? Uh, how do we start understanding subfactors with with small index? So the um, the uh, so the most important invariant. of a subfactor uh, is its principal graph. And I need to explain this to you for two reasons. Uh, one, because I want to explain a little bit about how the actual process of doing classifications works. And secondly, so that you can understand the, the results that I, that I show in, in, in a moment. So what is this principal graph? Well, it's a graph. So it has vertices of four different types. So remember over here, uh, we had this, this, this underlying fusion category C, but we've, and then we've got the category, we've got, so we've got C itself, we've got the 1A bimodule objects, we've got the A1 bimodule objects, which I didn't mention so far, and the AA bimodule objects. So the vertices are all of those things. The uh, some simple 1, 1, 1, A, a1 or AA bimodule objects in the category C. So it's a four part eight graph. The, the vertices come into, into four parts. And edges from X to Y, um, these are sort of pick an object from, from each of these guys. Uh, according to the dimension of some home space in the category. So what we can do is we can take X and we can tensor it. Well, um, I'll write question mark here. So A question mark is A or, uh, or A dual, where here we're thinking of A as a, I guess, a 1A. Uh, module object and a dual we're thinking of as an a1 um, bimodule object maybe I have that the wrong way around just depends how you m what order you multiply in I guess um, to X so this is some okay this a uh, seems a bit strange the first time you you see it but basically these edges here are recording some of the tensor product multiplicities of all of these objects it's not recording the full the full fusion ring of all of these different types of things it's just recording what you get when you tensor on the right with A, okay? So here, what, how do you know whether you're, whether you're meant, which version of A question mark you're meant to be using? Well, X here, remember, is from one of these four classes. So it's either a right A module or a right one module, okay? So if it's a right one module, then you better tensor with this guy so that you can tensor over one. If it's a right A module, you better tensor with this guy so that you can tensor over A, okay? You work out what you're meant to do by what sort of bimodule object it is. And this home here is uh, as whatever sort of bimodule object those things are. Okay. So there's that crazy, this, well, not that crazy, this very sensible graph, which is recording some of the fusion multiplicities of all of these objects. Uh, yeah, and there are no maps, so it doesn't make sense. Simple, yeah. 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 Okay. So let me give you two examples, because it's somewhat important to understand this, um, which makes it a disaster that I explained it so poorly. Um, so let's take um, C being, uh, you guys call it, I think, the Ising category, and I'll try and even remember the, the letters. Um, I've forgotten already. Sigma, Sigma. okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's not look at C, let's, uh, let's Forget sigma and just take that, su that really boring subcategory consisting of the one and psi particle. Then we can take A to be one plus psi, and you can take my word for it, or maybe you have some other way of knowing this, but this thing has an actual algebra structure on it, okay? And uh, what we find in this case, so it has, a, has an algebra structure. Okay. And it turns out the AA bimodules, uh, 
straight list, let's just look at the one A by modules are, uh, are really easy. There's just A itself, okay? There's, there's just a unique, by a unique one A by module. So M here is this really boring category. It's just, uh, it's just a single object category. And so what's the principal graph going to be? At least the, at least sort of these pieces of the principal graph, what do we get? Well, we've got vertices here for one and for psi, the simple objects in C. And we've got uh, a single object in the, in the one A by module category. And the tensor product rules are really simple. You take one and tensor it with A. Well, that's surely going to be A. Alternatively, uh, you can take psi and tensor it with A. Well, and there's only one thing you can possibly get in counting dimensions, and you see you get, you see you get A again. So this is the principal graph for, for, for that particular set. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what's it going to be? Um, No, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, <coughs> like, yeah. So, so what is this? Like, I'm so we've got this map from a tensor a to a. I mean, I know it's got an algebra structure for sort of general reasons that this has to work, and I haven't ever actually thought what it, the components actually look like. But what does this mean? Well, a map from a tensor a, we've got. Uh, um, what does a tensor a look like? It looks like um, one uh, plus a copy of psi plus a copy another copy of psi plus another copy of one when you expand that out, okay? Because yeah. psi squared is, is one. And we've got some map here to one plus, plus psi. So you just need to give me four scalars here for the component of the map from one plus one to one and another, and another two components for psi plus psi to psi. And there's some quadratic equation that says that that's an associative multiple uh, an associative multiplication, and I promise that you can solve those, and you know, there's one way to do it. Um, that's not very illuminating. Um, and then another thing that you have is that yeah. the ratio of the graph is two times base two, which is one plus psi, and so the base two uh, is yeah. minus one, so it's like two scalars plus the base two that you get. And the, yeah, okay, so you can see the algebra object as the, the, um, the twisted group algebra there. Uh, okay, so another example that's going to give us a much more complicated um, principal graph that will show up again in a second is that we could take uh, we could take the representation theory of of the finite group S five and take the algebra object to be um, Sort of the functions on this on the um, on the the cosets under under S four, uh, which we can make an algebra object under convolution. And now uh, the category of uh, of one A by modules is actually just uh, the representation theory of S four, and the principal graph is just showing you the induction restriction graph of S4 and S5. So I won't draw all of it, or, or draw the graph, but not draw all of the, the labels. So here we've got your trivial representation of S5, and it, uh, you can restrict it to the uh, trivial representation of S4, and then you can induct it back up and get two things in S5, the trivial plus one other plus one other guy, and so on. Okay, and we can, we can do this induction restriction calculation and, and find some much more complicated principal graph. Okay, one thing I want to say about this graph is that a sort of second order invariant, this is some, uh, it's an invariant of the subfactor, we can read it off from the principal graph. Notice this graph here had a chain of three edges before anything interesting happened. Okay, there's a branch up here, but up before that it's just a chain of edges. That initial length, of, uh, of boringness is called the supertransitivity. This is a, a number associated to a subfactor that we'll want to keep track of later. Uh, and it measures somehow the, the boringness 
of the low tensor powers of, of A. It's saying the low tensor powers of A break up in the simplest way possible. Okay. So two basic facts underlie the use of the principal graph in, um, in, in classifications. The first is simply that uh, you can read off the index of the subfactor, that is the dimension of the algebra object, directly from the principal graph. So uh, you can just read off the dimension of the algebra object as the square of the graph norm. And the graph norm is just the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. And then the second part of this, so let me write the graph norm as uh, the norm of a graph gamma. If, uh, if you've got gamma prime, which is uh, strictly bigger than some, some smaller graph, then the graph norm of gamma prime is strictly larger than the graph norm of gamma. So if we're trying to understand subfactors up to some index, if we've discovered that some graph has too large an index, immediately we know that all bigger graphs have too large an index as well. So we just prune off every larger graph when we're trying to understand what the possible principal graphs of subfactors up to some index could be. So that's the first reason that the principal graph is interesting. The second is that uh, this is by Okniani compactness plus epsilon. Uh, there are... Um, at most finitely many of these pairs, these standard invariants of a subfactor, of a finite depth subfactor, uh, with a given principal graph. So even just classifying the possible principal graphs of subfactors gives us up to finite ambiguity a classification of subfactors. Of course, this reconstruction process, listing the actual, the actual examples of the given principal graph is an extremely hard problem and tends to be kind of one paper per graph sort of work. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I never get this right. Um, so certainly what we want to be true is that all of these categories of bimodules it has are semi-simple categories. Yeah, the first one, yeah. Semi-simplicity is maybe unlikely to give you just one. I mean, there are... Um, so yeah, so we... Um, but I suspect... But I suspect that, that any algebra structures you can put on this object are all in decomposable still. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, so we, w we maybe... We at least want it to be unital so that there's a map from the... Yeah. Um, Let's try and get this straight afterwards, because I, I'm, yeah, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get Victor and Dimitri to help us say, help me say exactly what I meant to say. Okay, so, okay, so we have these two, these two facts, which make, um, it's overwhelmingly unlikely. We have a huge list of obstructions, things that we can answer just from the graph uh, that prevent it being the principal graph of a subfactor. In the small index range where we work, uh, the set of obstructions that we have seem to be really good, as in everything that survives them turns out to be realizable. But as you go out to higher indices, we're just lost and, and we can't say very much. Uh, uh, when I, yeah, let's, um, let me just show you some of what we get. And I think I can maybe add a little bit more to, to answering this question. Okay, so here's part of the map of subfactors. Um, so the coordinates we use um, are the index of the subfactor along the bottom and the supertransitivity, that length of the initial uh, chain of edges, uh, up. And so this is sort of the, the classical regime that I'm showing you here with index less than four. 
uh, there's, there's more to come. So uh, in, this, in this regime, um, there's, um, there are two series. There's an A series and a, and a D series. And these guys all come from sort of uh, SU2 at some level. Okay, so these are quotients of temporary leads. They're, uh, they're quite simple things. And you see some very familiar things as you start going up this series. Um, uh, I really should have said this before, but very often, and especially in the small cases, you've got this subfactor, you've got these categories C and M, and quite often uh, you can put C and M together, and that whole thing is itself a tensor category. So here I've drawn this principal graph here, which was that example I drew here, but in where when I was doing this example, this was the category and this was some extra thing. But in fact, in this case, you can make the whole thing a category, and which is why I've labeled that as Eisen. But maybe that's more confusing than it's worth. Um, but a bunch of familiar examples turn up on the A series. There's this overfold series, the D series that comes from it. And then there are these two, uh, these two special points, E6 and E8. Now, why is there an ADE classification below index 4? Basically, just because um, I've, just, uh, I've, I've hidden it, but basically just because there are no graphs with norm less than two besides ADE graph. Uh, but it turns out that nearly everything is realized except the D odds and E7. Yeah? So what is the index? The index is the dimension of this algebra object. Uh, so um, here the index is two. Which is the uh, index Yeah, which I, which I could alternatively read off from the adjacent thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I didn't, I neglected to draw it, uh, but at index four, there's also a whole lot of stuff. Um, I forget exactly where it all comes. Maybe there, something like that. Um, and while these guys are all related to SU2 at some root of unity, in somewhat complicated ways to explain the D and E series, these guys are all just related to finite groups and are sort of, uh, uh, are maybe even less exciting. So. In, the, in that first description I said of everything sort of fitting into four categories, everything here is related to something to do with SU2 at a root of unity, and everything here at index exactly four is just related to, uh, to stuff coming from finite groups. Is this, this, is this, is, this is everything. Um, the, um, yeah. Uh, possibly... Um, so, I mean, at infinite supertransitivity, that is just a single long chain of exes, that's not finite depth, there are infinitely many simple objects there, all hell breaks loose, and I, and I, I have absolutely nothing to say, but that's kind of outside of the world we're, we're talking about today. Um, you start to, this, this is no longer, I mean, a no longer a completely understood story once you include those guys. But certainly up to index four and finite supertransitivity, that's everything. There's, there's two different things in, in each of these two points. Yeah. Oh yeah, and lots of multiplicities here. Yeah, times infinity, times something finite, times something finite. Yeah. Okay. Um, what happened to E7 is a good question. I don't have a really good answer to. I mean, you can I can list a bunch of obstructions that tell you that graph can't possibly be the principal graph of a subfactor. There are number theoretic obstructions. There are a bunch of things you can say. Um, not there for one reason or another. Yeah, and the D odds are not there. They're only marked every second point in the D series. Yeah. Um, they maybe do exist in some sort of, some more general sense. Okay. And here's um, the rest of what we know of the small index classification. So I'm going um, up above four now. And in between four and five, there are just five examples of these things. Uh, well, maybe just ten. These each come in two, in a pair of two, two related things. So, what are they? Well, there's this thing called the Hagerup subfactor. Here's its principal graph, or at least uh, the one component of the principal graph. The sort of left one module, the left A modules, are another graph. There's the extended Hagerup subfactor up here. There's the Aceta Hagerup subfactor. As you can tell from these names, sort of these were all constructed one at a time by sort of brutal methods. Uh, there's this. This guy, which is the first one that above four that fits into a family, this is a GHJ subfactor, and you can build it by those sort of construction methods that I talked about from stuff down below index four. So this guy is, is 
sort of familiar. There's this strange one, 2221, which by now we understand how to build both from sort of quantum group origins and from quadratic category origins. So it sort of fits into, into families in well-understood ways. Then you get to index 5, so we're back again to an integer. And sure enough, everything that we see at index 5 comes from groups. Everything here is a group subgroup subfactor. And this, uh, this ref S4 example, ref S5 example that I was talking about is one of these points up here. Uh, and it's plausible, but as far as I know, hopeless conjecture, is that whenever you're at an integer index, you should expect everything to come from a finite group. Uh, eventually. Okay. Then you get a little bit further up and you see some things coming from quantum groups again. You get up to 3 plus square root 5, and you see a whole lot of crazy stuff, um, which it turns out in the last couple of years has all been explained in those sort of four categories that, are, that I was talking about. There's some quadratic category here, and then everything else here can either be built from it or can be built from stuff smaller, uh, built from much smaller stuff. And then this is sort of the current frontier of where we have a full classification of finite index subfactors, the invariance of finite index subfactors up to, up to five and a quarter. So what to say, what else to say about these things? Sorry? Um, sorry, oh, which ones are Maruta equivalent? Oh. Okay, so um, the, yeah, so let me, um, yeah, okay. So there's a, there's a strange, let me not try and give a complete answer, but let me explain one or two of these points by talking about Maruta equivalent. So this is stuff that, um, that Noah here in the audience and Finas Grossman and Masaki Azumi have almost finished writing a paper about, but I don't think Noah's going to talk about it, so it's okay that I say something. Um, the these guys here all used to be pretty pretty strange, and uh, they were constructed by brute force, by really unilluminating construction. And then, but it didn't take so long for um, for Masaki Azumi to give a good explanation of this Hagrup this Hagrup subfactor. Uh, in terms of these quadratic categories, or in terms of sort of an earlier, an, a less general version of these quadratic categories. And that whole theory then also gave constructions of these guys that I've called 3333. Uh, it's a kind of boring name that just describes what the graph looks like. And then the work that, uh, that Noah and co. have done just recently is, well, there are, there are two guys here at this point. Uh, there's a different finite group involved in each case. Uh, but there are some sort of other categories which are very, very much like these points with a yet another group, with which are quadratic, but have other things in the Maruta equivalence class which are not quadratic, and that, that turns out to explain the Aceta Hagrup subfactor. For a while, we thought it was really mysterious and had no connection with anything else, but actually, eventually, they, they discovered a Maruta equivalence with, with something much, much simpler. Not, not quite here. So these guy, these two here come from the group uh, Z2 cross Z2 or, uh, or Z mod 4, and they need to look at a quadratic category associated to Z mod 8. So it's just a, a little bit more complicated than, than those things. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. In any case, a little bit more complicated than those ones. Um, so another thing to observe here is that while below index 4, High supertransitivity is the norm. These guys go all the way up here. Uh, over here, it looks not so common. And in fact, uh, extended Hargrip is, is easily the record. Um, and I have a, a long-standing bet with Emily that this is going to win above index four, and we're never going to see something that, that highly supertransitive again. Um, there's some yeah, sort of, well, up to this line here. I mean, beyond here, we know very little. Um, the as the class, this, this sort of moving frontier, I mean, sort of, it, it reached here with, um, with Sven Popper's work quite a long time ago. Um, it, it moved up to 3 plus square root 3, um, work of Uffe Hagru, or 3 plus square root 3 is actually much more like, where is it, here, um, uh, a while ago ag again. Then it moved to 5 in the, was it a few years ago, and then 5 and a quarter next month, I guess. Um, and uh, the really surprising thing as we've gone along is that uh, there's much, much less than we ever expected. I think at every point, everyone expected there was a whole lot of stuff lurking around the corner, and it just keeps on being much sparser and much quieter than we ever expected. 
and it seems to be really, really difficult to have high supersensitive things. And in fact, hiding in this only times four here for a long time, we thought that was a times infinity. And that's sort of the fact that there are only finitely many things is related to high supersensitivity being extremely high. Okay. Um, the a few things to say then, then, a few final things to say about extended Hagerup. So it's now the lone, uh, the lone subfactor that appears to have nothing to whatsoever to do with anything else. One way that you can say that it, um, that it has not much to do anything, not not much to do with anything else, is that if you look at the fusion categories associated to it, you can't define them over a cyclotomic field, uh, unlike anything from rep U QG or rep G, which was always over a, worked over a cyclotomic field. Um, you can't do this guy over a cyclotomic field, which is a bit strange. On the other hand, you can't do Hagerup either. So things in the quadratic world are, are also strange in that sense. But that certainly means that on the fr from the list of constructions I wrote down, you're never going to get this from finite groups or quantum groups. Maybe, maybe there are more exotic things you can think of to get it from them. Um, we only, so we only have a really brutal construction of this guy. Just recently, we've worked out the center of, of the, the fusion category underlying extended Hagerup. So the center of extended Hagerup, uh, well, we, we know uh, has rank 22 now, and we have the SMT matrices, and uh, we're working on, on working out a few other things associated to it. But again, it shows there's nothing really familiar about what we see there. And so it's sort of a, one of the candidates for something quite exotic. Okay, I think I'll stop there. <laughs>